Hi. In this video, let's take a look at one of the cheapest 100 MHz digital oscilloscopes with the built-in function generator on the market. This is a Fenersi 1014D. I'm always amused at the product names Chinese companies choose, and this certainly is one of them. I believe this scope also comes in branded as EPUC ADS 1014D. As far as I can tell from the product specifications and pictures, these two oscilloscopes seem to be identical and are simply just rebranded. We see this quite often for a lot of Chinese products, especially in the multimeter market. And by the way, this review is by popular requests, as many people have asked me whether this is a good scope to buy, and I'm curious to find out as well. This scope comes in a generic carton box with all the accessories like the power brick, probes, USB cables, etc. as you would expect. While you do get a printed version of the product instruction manual, as you can see that it's very thin and it's not as detailed as one would expect. Now, if you take a look at the back of the unit, you will see some of the specs are actually printed on this label here. By the way, on Fenersi's website, there is a slightly more detailed spec sheet, but it is still at a pretty high level. Immediately, you can see where the corners are cut to achieve this price range. For instance, the storage depth is only at 240K. My 15-year-old Rigo DS1052E had one meg storage depth in comparison. Memory depth is important when doing single-shot measurement, and the bigger the storage memory, the larger the amount of data you can store and do analysis on. Another item I saw is the input sensitivity. The maximum sensitivity is spec'd at 50 millivolts per division which is much higher than the 20 millivolts per division typically you find on most of the entry-level DSOs. And besides these obvious ones, there isn't too much information we can glean from the spec. One obvious advantage of this scope is that it uses a 5 volt USB power supply so that it can be easily powered using a battery bank. This flexibility makes it very easy to use in portable fashion and it can come in quite handy when measuring mains earth referenced circuit, as you can let the entire oscilloscope float when using battery power. So let's power it on and uh, take it for a spin. Later on, we'll do a teardown and see what is inside. And as you can see, it powered on relatively quickly, which is definitely a nice feature to have. And one thing we'll see immediately is that on the scope, the controls are rather unconventional. It does take a little while for you to figure out what each of these buttons do. And if you want to refer to the manual, you can, but uh, the manual is nevertheless not that uh, detailed either. And unlike a lot of the scopes nowadays on the market, these encoders do not have the built-in button. So you have to use the OK here to do the selection. Now let me put a signal in. Currently the X channel is hooked up to the UTG962E function generator. So right now I'm outputting a 1 MHz, 1 volt peak to peak sinusoidal. So let me enable the channel. And of course, uh, let's do some auto adjustment here. And you can see that we acquired the signal with uh, relatively no issue at all. Some of the parameters are displayed on the side, as you can see. And let me zoom it in a little bit more so you can see a little bit more clearly. So we do have this section, by the look of it, is for channel 1, and this section is for channel 2. Currently, the channel 2, as you can see, is uh, disabled. And on channel 1, currently we're displaying RMS, frequency, and uh, peak to peak voltage. By the way, the peak to peak looks a little bit off. Oh, I know why, because I bet it's because we're set to times 10 here. So let's change that. For To change that, I'm pressing the config. As you can see that, yep, the probe is times 10. So let's see if I change to times 1. Yep, if we change to time 1, you can see that the VPP actually changed back to 1 volt, so no problem. So let me change it back to times 10 just because later on I'll be hooking on the scope here. So it doesn't really matter the absolute uh, value here. 
With the waveform on the screen, you can use these knobs to adjust its position, and it's actually relatively fast. That's actually pretty impressive here. So now let's uh, reduce the time base, and uh, let's take a look. And as we reduce the time base, you will see that uh, actually started aliasing, which is uh, quite typical for a lot of scopes in this price range. And uh, let's keep reducing that. Whoa! Hello? It seems that once we reduce to a certain point, the display becomes garbled. And clearly the scope was able to detect waveform, but for whatever reason it's not able to display that sinusoidal. Hmm, that is certainly very interesting. So I'm not entirely sure what the deal is, but clearly this is uh, definitely a concern here. So let's uh, start increasing it. See what we got. Whoa! There's some interesting artifact there. Not entirely sure what is going on, but you can see the very slow shifting of the waveform when we when we decrease the time. I'm actually curious to see what the actual frequency response looks like for this 100 MHz scope, whether or not it can achieve that 100 MHz bandwidth. Now, the UTG962E can only output a 60 MHz sinusoidal, but uh, let's start from there. Let's start ramping up the signal output frequency and see how the amplitude responds. Keep in mind that right now we're outputting a 1 volt peak to peak. As you can see here, yeah, so right now we're displaying 10 volts because we have a times 10 probe set. So let's uh, see when that drops to roughly 7 volts that tells us the actual bandwidth. So let's uh, start ramping up the signal frequency here and we'll see. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's go to 10. No problem. And uh, 20. As you can see that actually we're not doing that great. So right now we're at uh, 10, right? This is 10 megahertz. First of all, the signal started uh, wobbling a little bit. Let's uh, expand the time base. Wow. Did you see that artifact? That's very strange. Uh, but anyway, so let's... Uh, I've never seen that happening on scopes before, but uh, there's some algorithm to do the switching apparently, and uh, that looks very interesting. So let's switch to the highest, rather the fastest time base, and uh, let me continue increasing the output frequency. So right now we're at 10 megahertz. You can see that we're already started to drop in the measured peak-to-peak uh, -peak voltage here. So let's uh, do it one megahertz at a time. Yeah, as you can see, we are not looking that good. So right now we're only at the 20 megahertz. We're already dropped to 8.5 volts. So that does make you wonder what the real bandwidth of this uh, scope is. So let's keep increasing here. And uh, we are at uh, 30 megahertz, which we already dropped below the 7 volts peak to peak. So, which means in reality, the actual bandwidth is roughly just 30 megahertz. Wow, so from that, it seems that the spec is actually heavily inflated here. Well, let's uh, keep increasing to see what we've got here. So now we're at uh, 40. As you can see, that amplitude continued to decrease. And uh, at uh, 50 megahertz, you can see that we are already dropped to almost half of what the VPP is supposed to be. So now at the 60 mark, you can see that we are already at 5.2 volts. Okay, I think it's time for us to actually get a signal generator that can generate 100 megahertz. And I wanted to see what exactly the frequency response looks like at 100 megahertz. And now I just swapped the signal generator to the HP8642B, and that one is very capable. We can generate up to 2.1 gigahertz, so it is well beyond the capability of this oscilloscope. But uh, the first thing I actually noticed right now, where, by the way, I started with the 60 megahertz just so that we can continue where we left off with the UTG962E. The first thing I notice is, for whatever reason, the whole signal, entire signal, is shifted downwards by at least half of a division here. As you can see, 
Now, I don't believe, if you look at here, it's set to AC couple, so it should be centered. So not entirely sure why that is the case, and uh, that is actually could be a problem, but let's start increasing the output uh, frequency and see what we got. So I adjusted the output to be roughly where we were before. So now you're reading 5.3 volts peak to peak. And uh, let's uh, start increasing the frequency here. So let's do 70 megahertz. And you can see that we dropped significantly. Right now it's only four volts now. And we can increase to 80. So clearly the bandwidth is nowhere near the 100 megahertz that is specified and uh, right now at 80 megahertz you can see that we dropped even further to just above 3.2 volts and let's go to 90 and uh, we dropped below 3 volts so let's change it to 100 megahertz And you can see that we are not able to even display the 100 megahertz signal here. So let's change it back to 90 megahertz. And uh, while well, we can display it, but you can see the frequency counter is actually not able to count it accurately. So clearly the bandwidth of this scope is limited. To further confirm that this scope is bandwidth limited, I'm using an avalanche pulse generator to generate a very fast rising pulse. As you can see, we are capturing that pulse on the screen here. I have used the same generator to measure the rise time for many different scopes in the past. As you can see here, the captured signal is not that clean. The signal wobbles quite a bit. Currently, the horizontal is set at 20 nanoseconds per division, and you can see that we're roughly taking up half of a division. So this translates into roughly a 10 nanoseconds rise time. So based on this measurement, the rise time of the scope is actually at just above 30 megahertz, which is pretty much what we observed earlier. And here is a 200 kilohertz AM signal with a 10 megahertz carrier frequency. And what you're looking at here is a frequency modulated signal. The carrier frequency is set at 2 megahertz, and the frequency deviation is 1 megahertz with a modulation frequency of 200 kilohertz. And here is the scoping XY mode displaying a least assured figure. The acquisition rate in the XY mode is not that great. Right now I'm only outputting a 1 kHz and a 1.5 kHz respectively for both of the channels, and you can see the figure. But if I increase the frequency a little bit more, you won't be able to see the figure anymore. For instance, right now we're at 10 kHz and 15 kHz respectively, and you can see that we already don't have enough sample points to show the figure correctly. And the scope also comes with a function generator. Right now I have the function generator output hooked up to the channel 1 input. And you can already see the waveform displayed on the oscilloscope. So let's uh, poke around here. And as you can see, we have different uh, types by the look of it we can select from. Yep, we can select different waveforms. And I assume we can also change the frequency. Let's uh, change to an interesting waveform first and uh, let's go to frequency and uh, let's uh, change it by the look of it we can only change it up to two megahertz which is probably the maximum yeah that is the maximum specified frequency which is uh, more than enough in most of the applications so that definitely is a nice touch with the built-in function generator and you can see we have all sorts of different waveforms. Now, the staircase looks a little bit of uh, distorted. That's because the output frequency is set at 2 megahertz. So let's uh, reduce that to see if we can see any clearer pictures here. And uh, let's uh, do... So you can already see it's a lot more cleaner as we reduce the frequency. So that's very typical. And if I just... Uh, change the time base here, you'll see that the staircase looks actually quite good. Now let's proceed with the teardown. 
Given what we have seen in terms of performance, my expectation is pretty low. But let's open it up and take a look. And yep, it is pretty much what I expected. If you look at the circuit board, there's no trace length matching for high-speed design whatsoever. And by the look of it, the firmware is actually stored in this micro SD card. The main microprocessor used here is an F1C200S, which is a 32-bit microprocessor based on the ARM9 CPU architecture. We have seen this chip used in the Hentec DSO 2D10 I reviewed a while back. The ASIC used in this scope, of course, is a no-name brand, and I assume these chips without any markings are probably ADC or perhaps DAC chips. Given the performance we saw earlier, that most definitely these chips are not up to the spec required for the advertised bandwidth. And uh, here we can see a 5351 clock generator, and this is a 25Q80 flash memory chip. And by the look of it, we have a Giga device GD32F230 ARM processor right here. That's pretty much all the components that you can see on this side of the board. Of course, we have two shielding cans up here. These are presumably the input section. Now, I'm not able to take these apart because these are soldered in, but I don't think there's anything spectacular underneath anyway. Now, with all the issues we have seen here, I cannot recommend this scope at all. Being able to be powered by battery is perhaps the only upside that you get from this scope. And your money probably would be much better spent buying one of the O1 or Hentac portable oscilloscopes that I had reviewed a while back. For roughly the same price that you pay, you would get much better performance. Personally, I wouldn't touch this scope with a 10-foot pole. It is sad to see that there are so many reviews on the internet actually touting this is a great scope. I for sure would definitely not waste my money on a scope like this. Anyway, let me know what you think about this oscilloscope in the comments below. Well, I hope you find this video informative. Please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe. I do videos like this so you don't have to waste your hard-earned money on products like this. I will catch up with you next time.